Happy Friday, everybody. What a gorgeous day we have for the second day of fall. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Brentwood. We will start our meeting today with an invocation by David Carden, and the Pledge and Four-Way Test will be led by Steve Puff. See if I can read. Let's pray. Lord, bless this gathering of Rotarians today. Please help us to see those in need and give us the strength and wisdom to serve our community as we should. Help us to lift the burdens of others while we maintain the dignity of our fellow humans. Soften our hearts to be sensitive and loving as we serve together as Rotarians. We pray for the eradication of polio. Help us to be a part of that and to help see that come to fruition. We're grateful for this food that we've been provided as we know everything, all our provision comes from you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, if you'll join me in the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic in which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now, the four-way test, the things we think, say, and do. First. Second. Third. Fourth. Plus one. Sherry Koss is going to introduce guests and visitors today. Does anyone have a guest with them? I, I recognize a gentleman that has very long hair. He has very long hair. And he's got on something orange. Oh my Lord, it's blinding. I'd like to say hello to Mr. Jeff. Thank you. Well, glad to be here. Good to see everybody. Woohoo. Anyone else? Anyone else have a guest? I think that's okay. It. Well, that was short. Short, <laughs> except for his hair. That's right. Uh, okay, so to for today's Rotary Minute. Uh, David actually um, did not know this, but he teed me up perfectly uh, during his prayer. So you have gotten one email. You may have even gotten this twice because we weren't sure how it was sent through the district. But October 12th is World Polio Day. And for the uh, newer Rotarians, we do a fundraiser every year um, for the eradication of polio and it's in conjunction with Dunkin Donuts. And so this is what we call purple pinky donut uh, sales. Um, and so in countries where the threat of polio remains high, every child under five years old who gets a vaccine has purple ink put on their pinky. And that is just as a symbol that they have been vaccinated. And so Dunkin' Donuts, uh, these donuts are actually fairly ugly, <laughs> but they are, uh, <laughs> they're like, they're in the shape of a pinky and they have purple icing on one side, but they're still delicious. They are very yummy, ugly donuts. So uh, this Wednesday, which is October 5th, is the last day that you can place your order for purple pinky donuts. You will have the link in the email that you received. Um, to place that order. And then you pick up your donuts from Dunkin' Donuts on Wednesday, October 12th. So think about, you know, if you don't, aren't a fan of donuts, think about who you might be able to buy donuts and deliver them to. Might be a fun thing to take to, you know, kids, friends who have kids or uh, our police or you know, firefighters, anybody that you want to take a treat to, neighbors, anything. So please order Purple Pinky Donuts. There's also a link on there if you are interested in just donating, but you don't want um, donut calories, you can just give the money. So that is today's Rotary Minute. And now Susie Lindsay will lead us in Happy Butts.
this we're on. All right. Happy Bucks. Who's happy? Come on. There's no football going on. There's no homecomings anywhere. Nothing happening. All right. We've got one. First taker. Thank you. I want to express uh, it's a little bit past my first anniversary of being part of this club, and I just want to express my gratitude to uh, this group. My parents taught me uh, something when I was young that if you surround yourself with good people, it'll you'll never go wrong and it'll improve your life. So I'm grateful to this group for the influence uh, on me and uh, to be a part of this group and to keep this part as apolitical as possible. It also has given me opportunity to explore new avenues of service to our community. So thank you very much. Thanks, David. Sarah, I don't know why you would have something to be excited about or to share. I'm putting in $5. Number one, I'm super excited that this man has graced us with his presence again. I thought he was gonna go the, the path of Kenny Lane. And when does police and fire ever follow themselves? I'm just not this guy part. I'm talking about never coming back to Rotary Park. Come on now. Glad everybody enjoyed that comic relief. Um, and also, I am excited that tomorrow is the opening, grand opening of the inclusive playground, the Miles Together Playground. 9 a.m. Be there, be square, have Sarah come find you later. So, um, we'd love to see as many of our Rotarians come out and support that can. And thank you all for all your donations and your giving. Foundation drives coming up. It's because of you these things are possible. Thanks. Where are your rotary ladies? Oh. Yeah, we're, we're rotary things. And, and pat yourselves in the back, y'all. We all worked hard under Sarah's leadership and Sarah's determination to do this. And it's a great gift for the community. So let's give ourselves a hand. Yes. 700,000. That's awesome. Hurry. And our chief, Jeff, rode his horse in today. That's why he was a little late. He named his horse Chief. And that dollar is going to buy hay for the horse. Anybody else over here? Okay. All right, Devin. So I'm putting uh, $5 in today because he wouldn't say it himself, but uh, David Carden mentioned serving in other ways. David has raised his hand to uh, volunteer to the community. He's running for public office. Uh, if you vote, have voted for Sheila in the club for school board rep, or you remember Bert Chalfont, David is running to fill Bert Chalfont's vacant seat. So if you live in the 7th District, make sure you talk to him. Anyone else? Happy Bucks? Happy, happy? All right. Everybody? You know, I'm happy that uh, that Monday night football game is over. Okay. Anybody else? Going, going. Back to you. Okay. Thank you, Susie. So, a couple of quick announcements. First of all, the Martin Center is selling the City Saver book, which is, you know, has all kinds of different coupons in it. I've got a list that I'll put up here of all the different uh, coupons that are in there. If you're interested, they are $30 a book and you can get them at the front desk. And then also the Martin Center, uh, you should have one of these on each table. They're having their art show, which is a fundraiser for, uh, you know, for their programs on Friday, October 28th and Saturday, October 29th. If you're interested in coming to the reception the night before, they do ask that you RSVP. Uh, which is a concept with which we are familiar. <laughs> uh, and then let's see, Hunter McCarty has an announcement about something we all need to participate in. I know nobody's heard about the Waverly Food Distribution Drive, but anyway, we, we've talked about this. We've sent out emails on it. We, and now that date is coming up. It's October the 8th, so we're two weeks out. We want to have a really good turnout from our group. And what happened a few months back, they changed the rotation of the food drive. Instead of being every second Saturday, it still stays on the second Saturday of the month, but they started grouping it by 
by different groups that would take those Saturdays. So we ended up getting the October 8th for the Rotary Clubs in Williamson County. So it's very important that we support that drive. So I'll, next week, I will get out an email to get a count so we can determine how many people we have that want to be a part of it. You can go on your own, you can carpool, and we may, if we have enough people, actually rent either a van or a bus, whatever it takes. But we're going to have a big turnout for that morning. It starts at 7, so you have to get up reasonably early and get to Waverly by at least 7 o'clock. The food is then packaged and ready for the people to come through the line at 9 o'clock. The line lasts about an hour to an hour and a half, so you're really through by 10.30, and you're back in Brentwood or Franklin or Nashville by noon. So it's about a half a day, but it's a great opportunity for us to serve our community. So we'll see you all there, I hope. One more last plea. If you are able to be there on October 8th, please do it it's I mean you'll get more out of it than than you're giving and you'll be happy you got up at oh dark 30 to get there and on top of that you guys Franklin Evening Club always shows up in a big way and there is a uh, district governor's citation on the line here so let's show up and show the evening club what Brentwood Noon is made of and with that, I will ask Tom Carr to come up and introduce our speaker, which if you paid attention to Reflections, uh, you may have seen that Larry is supposed to be today's speaker. He is not Miss Tennessee. Um, he uh, tested positive for COVID and our speaker to whom we are very grateful was able to switch dates with Larry. So golf tour tournament will be next week. Tom. We're going to need to make this taller. Yeah, okay. So Lori Reed contacted me earlier this week and asked if I would introduce Miss Tennessee. And I said, I don't know, Lori, I'm very busy. Yes, I'll do that. <laughs> um, but anyway, we've met Tally, and um, she is a lovely young lady. She's originally from Robertson County, but she was raised in Nashville, and uh, she graduated with honors from Belmont University Curb College in 2019 with a business administration degree. And she co-founded an event production company at 19, pretty amazing, and produced more than a dozen concerts and festivals as a full-time student. So she's obviously very busy. She has studied social innovation at the University of Edinburgh School of Business, that's Scotland, not Edinburgh, Tennessee. And she's also studied conservation in Costa Rica. I, that's a place I'd like to go. Uh, just to be there. She considers her greatest honor uh, the year of service she recently completed as Miss Tennessee in 2021 and with the Miss America organization. She hopes and she's walked in the Nashville red carpet. She spoke to thousands, traveled over 20,000 miles and earned over $35,000 in scholarships, which she hopes to finish uh, at, where does she want to go? Yeah, London. She wants to go to London and finish her degree, uh, another degree there as well. I had to skim, skim down. There's a lot of stuff here. I don't want to take up too much time because I wanted to have a lot of time to talk to you. So without further ado, Miss Tally Bevis, Miss Tennessee 2021. Well, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, before I start, um, I just want to share a little anecdote about why I love Rotarians. Um, my great grandfather was a dentist in Johnsonburg, Pennsylvania many years ago. And he actually started the first Rotary Club in Johnsonburg. He was their first president and he started the club there. And he was known for his, I don't know if uh, any of y'all um, try for this, but his perfect attendance. I won't call anyone out that doesn't have perfect attendance, but I'm sure most of you don't. Um, and what's so cool is that as he continued to age, they would travel and they would travel on the Rotarian schedule. They would find, I mean, this is in 
the 30s and 40s, they would travel and write ahead and make sure that they could get to a rotary meeting wherever they were going across the country. They did a lot of road trips. And what's most special and what I think speaks most to the Rotarian spirit and the community that you build is that when he was um, not able to, due to illness, not able to go up the stairs in their community center in Johnsonburg, Pennsylvania, enough members would come down the stairs so they had quorum so that he could be present for those meetings. I know. So it really, it always chokes me up because um, it's just such a special reminder that um, Rotary is so much bigger than the Brentwood Club. And also that all of you are, are in community with each other while you continue to serve the community outside these doors. And so I'm just so honored to be here. I have so much I want to cover. Um, as you can imagine, after a year of Miss Tennessee, you have a lot you can talk about. Um, but one of the things that we I think is most poignant right now is that we are headed into a general election. And my year as Miss Tennessee was primarily focused on civic literacy education, voter registration advocacy, um, and so much more in between. And what I think is most important is that I, you know, I'll say again later, but voting is naturally nonpartisan. The act of voting is something that's not only a right, but also a responsibility, especially as women, because so many women fought for it. And the, the Miss America organization, I think sometimes a lot of my year was about building and rebuilding and breaking down misconceptions of what Miss America is now, where it came from and what the role of Miss Tennessee is. And so I hope that you'll just garner a little bit of information, hopefully it'll inspire you um, to lean in and as Tennesseans to just continue to serve, which you already do every day. If you're here, I'm preaching to the choir. This is the choir, um, if you're wondering. So um, I'm just really excited about that. But um, I could talk for literally two hours on the slides that I have. So we're just gonna like roll through it and they can send it out if you're even extra interested in seeing more. Um, but I wanna talk about the brief history of Miss America, the intersection of Miss America and the suffrage movement, which actually has a lot of parallels. I think especially the women in the room would find that very interesting, but also Tennessee's specific role in the 19th amendment, which probably a lot of y'all already know, but I just wanna touch on it because it's so unique. Um, but also my year, and it was a trip to say the least. Um, so I'm just so excited to share. Um, uh, if you don't know, the Miss America organization started in 1921 in Atlantic City. It was part of a program and a, a festival to extend the season of tourism in Atlantic City. And um, it, it started to genuinely bring people from around the country and beautiful women at that. That was their goal. Um, Margaret Gorman was our first golden mermaid. Um, I don't know if I'd ever want to be crowned golden mermaid now, um, but it was, it was an honor at the time and it was a brand new program. And at the the end of her year, she was then crowned Miss America as she gave up her title. Um, and she was only 16 years old. I was crowned at 24. I'm now 25. Um, I cannot imagine um, being paraded around the country in a bathing suit after having been measured on the boardwalk with six other women that were sent by newspapers from around the country. I just can't imagine it. So um, weird, but amazing and so unique and so uniquely American. So this is just a little timeline. Um, we then joined, you know, we had an evening gown competition. And then in the 20s, mid 20s, Miss America made $100,000 on appearance fees, which at the time was more than most actors actresses, models, even I think more than the president of the United States in 1926. Um, and so it was, that's when it really kind of started to garner a lot of attention. Um, and then we added a talent portion and it, the congeniality award. So, you know, in 1939, and then the first scholarship was awarded in 1945. And it was a $5,000 scholarship because that Miss America who won didn't like refused to go around in a swimsuit. She refused to be paraded like that. She never wore a swimsuit again after she won in it. And I think if that's not telling to the future, it's really special. But also Miss America was the number one woman to sell war bonds in the country. And that means that we not only had a cultural impact, but we also had a financial impact on America. Um, and this is just some old photos of the classic Miss America who like watched Miss America growing up. 
right? Like most people. Um, and it was, I mean, it was prime time, baby. It was like people planned for it. They had parties for it. Um, but she was literally called Bond Girl and it's not, you know, a Charlie's Angels moment. It's not, she wasn't, you know, in a fast car. She was literally the Bond Girl because she raised over 5 million in war bonds. And what's so cool and I want to point out here is that if you look on the bottom right, that's her selling war bonds. And what is she not wearing? A crown. Miss America doesn't just serve with a crown on, right? And so I'm here and I'm so honored to be here. I'm not Miss Tennessee right this second. Um, we have an awesome new woman in that role at this moment, but I had, I really tried to do most of the work in my year and most of my advocacy without a crown or sash on, on my body. Because I think that sometimes it can take away from what we're trying to do and right, it's symbolic, but it doesn't have to mean everything. And then it continued on. In 1945, 27 million people, a few from this room, were watching, were watching Miss America. Burt Parks joined as the master of ceremonies. And then by 1959, every state was represented. Um, but then it kind of turned, right? Women were going through a lot and there were protests on the boardwalk. They were protesting against it, considering it a, a step back in the women's fight for equality and freedom. And um, we also had our first black candidate, not until the 1970s. I mean, it's honestly, when you think back, it's pretty crazy. Um, but then Miss Vanessa Williams was our first Black Miss America in 1983. She's obviously still a huge figure. Um, and that's her on the right when she won Miss America. And it's just, I think it was almost, it really was part of our pop culture, Miss America at that time. Um, but then there were protests and it was called the Freedom Trash Can. And it was, they called it a symbol of oppression. And it's pretty unique that it was a women's organization that was already providing female scholarships, but it was also being considered oppressive by certain women in America. And I think that that just shows that there can be so many different reasons why an organization changes. And one of them, and the reasons why Miss America has changed is because of that. Um, these are just more images from it. I mean, they literally tossed bras in a trash can and lit it on fire. <laughs> I mean, I think I wanna do that now, but, um, but it's, you know, it's pretty unique. And so I think what's really interesting also is that Miss America was constantly a bit ahead of the curve. They were changing. They were, um, they were, you know, integrating in the seventies and they were, um, they, they started to redetermine what mattered. And it was more about the scholarships and it was less about your physical appearance. And by 2019 or 20 summer of 2018, they decided to remove the swimsuit competition. And I competed at Miss Tennessee for, for the first time with a swimsuit. And I just didn't feel empowered. I didn't get it. I didn't understand why we were doing it. I thought I was there for college scholarships. And honestly, I'm not great at math, but the, it did not add up um, in my head. So um, a lot of the pageant language was gone. And so now we're a scholarship competition. And y'all ever heard of like the platform, your pageant platform, right? Did anyone ever compete in Miss America? Did any of the women ever do anything with Miss America? Have a friend that did something with it? Yeah. Um, you know, that was like your platform. I mean, it was Miss Congeniality to a T sometimes, um, but it really has shifted and the social impact initiative part, that's the sort of platform 2.0. Um, but it also did a big focus on diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, and so I just love this so much because one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that the suffrage movement and the propaganda from the suffrage movement was an inspiration for the Miss America program's sashes. So it was almost considered a propaganda piece at the time. And so from the votes for women sash to the Miss America sash, that's where that inspiration came from. And part of the Miss America program is, um, you do a show us your shoes parade where you decorate a pair of shoes and you have this entire um, sort of outfit surrounding either your state or something you're passionate about. So for my show us your shoes parade, I did a votes for women uh, theme because of Tennessee's rich history in regards to the 19th amendment. And so that's me um, up in Connecticut, in Mystic, Connecticut, where we did the show us your shoes parade. And it was this was last September, just over a year ago. And the Miss America sash, again, these are just examples and iterations of the Miss America sash. And then me in the corner, um, you can't win them all. 
Uh, but um, that's just such a, it's such a cool way to see that things can shift and change. Organizations have to evolve, but it's still so cool what we can sort of create and what the history has been. Um, and then obviously Tennessee, if you probably, if you've been under a rock, um, we were the 36th and final state needed to ratify the 19th amendment. And it came down to one vote, which was Harry Byrne. He was the youngest member of the House of Representatives at the time in Tennessee. And that's him on the right. Um, and that's his mother in the middle. Have y'all ever heard like um, Mo mother knows best, right? And you kind of like roll your eyes like, oh, okay. And what's interesting is that his mom really did know best because if you don't know the story, his mother wrote him a letter and he was, he was anti-suffrage and he was planning to vote against the 19th amendment. And this is part of her writing and this is the letter. And she said, basically don't forget, quote, don't forget to be a good boy. Mind you, he's a house of representatives member. He was in his early twenties but she wanted him to be on the right side of history. And he did not forget because he wrote, I believe in full suffrage as a right. I believe we had a legal and moral right to ratify. I know a mother's advice is always safest for her boy to follow. And my mother wanted me to vote for ratification. That is what Harry Byrne wrote. So I know, I'll give it up for his mother. I know, pretty insane. And genuinely, we were, 35 states had voted for ratification. We were the 36th and we were the only state teetering on the edge. If Harry Burns mother had not gotten up in his business and sent him a letter, we might be having a very different conversation and history would have been a little bit different. And I just think that that's such a unique reminder that honestly, it can come down to one person doing just a little bit more of the right thing. And I think that's so much about ro what Rotary is, right? It's just all of us coming together and making unique additions and just doing a little bit more of the right thing every time. So if you haven't been there, the Parthenon actually has, have y'all seen it? The Tennessee Women's Suffrage Monument. It's so amazing and it's pretty new. It's only a couple years old. And this was me right before, um, right after I won Miss Tennessee, I went there again. I'd been there many times and it's such an amazing memory for me. And I would highly recommend to go to Centennial Park, go to the Parthenon and go see that. Um, it, it's almost like there's a reverence around it. And one of those women um, is a Tennessean and she's at the forefront of that. Um, and I'll get, I'll get back to her, uh, but one of the things that really drew me to working on voter advocacy in Tennessee is that you may have heard all press is good press, but not always in my opinion, because Tennessee in 2016 ranked 50th in voter turnout with by a Pew survey. And I don't know if y'all know this, but 50th is the worst. Um, again, math is hard, but um, we were ranked 50th for voter turnout in, um, in 2016. And this was when a couple of years later in 2018, I went to Miss Tennessee for the first time. And that's when I really was like, okay, there, we have got to do something. And while it has improved a little bit, you literally can't get worse. So I guess that's the point. Um, we, we really, it, I mean, we have improved 8.9% uh, statewide for 2020, but it is on us to make sure that it doesn't dip again. Um, and my home county went up 10 points, um, Robertson County, I'm from the historic district in Springfield originally, um, my mom's a divorce lawyer there, hopefully you don't know her, um, hopefully you don't need to, but in my opinion, um, there really is no democracy without voters, and I feel like a lot of times people think, oh, Miss Tennessee is this pretty face, Miss Tennessee is like, oh, she's so cute, like she like looks so good in a dress or look at that sparkly crown. And one of the things that I really try to do as Miss Tennessee is to take up space, is to start a conversation, right? Because Miss Tennessee is a full-time job and you travel full-time across the state and you have to have a social impact initiative. And that's part of why you're chosen for the job is because the judges think that what you're working on is important. And so in my opinion, 
there's no democracy without voters, but there's no voters without trust in the process, right? That's like literally every news story is about, are, do we trust this? And are we trusting institutions in place that are meant to protect them? And so realities in Tennessee, as I was headed into my year, historically low turnout, um, there's now criminalization. If you register wrong, if you register people wrong, you can go to jail or get you know, $10,000 fines. I mean, this is not partisan. This is just reality. Um, we, you know, there's some restrictions and there's really strict absentee ballot laws. If you're a first time student, if you're a first time college student and you're 18 years old and you just registered to vote and you're going to college across the state or out of state, you are not eligible to vote until you vote in person, if you did not register with an official election office. So vote.org, you see it all over social media. If I was 18 years old and I was headed out of the state for college and I registered with vote.org because everyone told me I should register to vote, I would not be eligible to vote on November 8th, even if I wanted to send in an absentee ballot because you cannot, you cannot vote until you vote in person. That will disenfranchise so many college students and it has for a long time. And so these are just conversations we have to be having. Um, and we have literally almost no civic literacy education. And that's something that I really just tried to bridge a tiny little gap during the year. I can't promise I did a ton, but I did something. Okay, so fun pictures. Um, I was crowned on July 3rd of 2021. How many, what time is it? I don't even know. Okay, give me like, give me two more hours, be good? No, I'm kidding. Um, and so I was crowned on July 3rd of 2021 and my life changed in an instant. I earned right then in that moment, 15,000 more in scholarships than I had already earned. And since Miss America is now over, I've earned over $35,000 in academic scholarships because of the Miss Tennessee and Miss America organizations, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, Belmont's expensive, if you don't know. Um, and so it's now paid off my undergraduate degree. So again, my guiding principle in my year was that the act of voting is naturally nonpartisan. It's not my decision to who you vote for. It's my, my chance to encourage you to do so and to do so with knowledge of less about voting red or blue, but voting based on your principles and really just investing 10% more into the voting process. So I travel more than 20,000 miles in my trusty red Jeep, which is outside and on its last leg. Um, I supported civic literacy in schools. I met with, I literally, my youngest reading was three years old and they were more interested in the color blocks than the book that I had, the children's book on reading on um, civic literacy and voting. And I championed voter organizations like Headcount, um, vote.org again, but still with this nuance of this absentee ballot issue. I partnered with the Secretary of State's office, which aged a little poorly. If you guys have read, if you guys read news this summer, um, but also what's cool about the Secretary of State's office is that they created a program called the Ann Dallas Dudley Award. And remember when I said that that woman in the statue that was holding up the banner. That's Ann Dallas Dudley. So when you go look for Ann Dallas Dudley, there, she was someone who was there and did marches of 3000 plus women down Broadway for the suffrage movement before the vote was cast. And it's a really incredible program that was started by the Secretary of State's office and his director of communications, um, Julie, Julia, because it was to encourage senior classes to vote for with 85% or more of their senior class registering. So I got to go to five of the schools to help present the Ann Dallas Dudley Awards, and those five schools had 100% participation with class sizes between 10 and 100 students, both public and private. So I got to do that. I went to a tail voter tailgates at Austin P. State University. Um, we did some work together at the Capitol, which you'll see on that's us on the right. But it was so cool to see that there is a way to invest in these next generation of voters and to encourage them to do so. And they don't earn anything, but their school gets a recognition. And it's really special because these seniors did it in part for themselves, but they also did it in part to prove that their school matters to them. And it's really for the school. So that was a really incredible opportunity. So I lobbied in DC. Um, I planned a weekend. I uh, was kind of during COVID still. So I didn't get to do a ton, but I did wiggle my way into um, Senator Haggerty's and Senator Blackburn's offices. Um, I've um, 
talk to them about civic literacy education in the state of Tennessee, just some, some need for that and what I was working on as Miss Tennessee. Um, I also addressed the Tennessee State Senate, um, which I know we probably all have friends there, but they um, don't listen very well. Um, if they don't want to listen to Miss Tennessee, I really wonder if they're ever listening to each other. And I think that's what we're missing, right? We're missing dialogue, conversation, compromise isn't a bad word. I feel like I, you're going to bleep me out when I say compromise, like on the YouTube video later, but you know, that's what we're missing. Right. And so I had to literally lean into the mic, speak over them and ask them to listen in. I got five minutes with them and it took me about 60 of those seconds to just get their attention. And that's, that's sad. Whoever said that it's so true because it was everyone. It didn't matter what political affiliation you had, they weren't listening. And hopefully I got them in, leaning in by the end, but sometimes you show up places and you think you already know your agenda. You know how you're gonna vote. You know if you're coming to the food drive. You're not listening. Go to the food drive. Um, you know, you're not listening. Announcements, right? We just like, it, we just get in our own heads and we're so laser focused on our own trail and our own path and our own plans and our own goals, right? That sometimes all we have to do is flip off that switch and open our ears and just have a conversation, right? I think we're all a little bit more similar than we, we think we are. I also worked with Fort Campbell schools where uh, one of the senior classes I spoke to um, in March of 2022, had still not learned about the Electoral College. They were seniors and they were about to graduate from high school. And the government teacher said, oh, we're just not there yet. I asked them, could someone explain to me the Electoral College and one busybody in the front? He was great, but he wanted to answer everything. You know, those people, I was that person, I'm gonna be honest. And someone told me I give them class president energy. I said, thank you. I'll take that. Um, but, you know, he was the only one in the class that could even really describe it and understand that all these local elections have nothing to do with the Electoral College and that these are conversations I'm having with like 18 year olds that are about to graduate on an installation with military family. Like you would think that our civic literacy education is best there. I mean, it's, it's crazy to me, honestly, but it's our reality right? It's our reality. And 80% of Fort Campbell, just because it says Kentucky, 80% is in Tennessee. It's just that post office is across the darn line. And so I take, I take full credit for Fort Campbell or 80% of it. I launched a podcast called the Suffragette series, which I have two more episodes that are going to come out and then it's going to be rebranded. I would love for you to listen in some really amazing women in arts and politics and a former Miss Tennessee, Brianna Mason in the center there. She was our first black Miss Tennessee, which is both really incredible because she crowned me, but also super depressing that it took until 2019 to happen. Um, and it's been a really incredible year. And then Miss America, it was so incredible. I brought the conversation of voter rights and access and turnout to the Miss America stage at the 100th anniversary Miss America competition, which is a very unique um, story that I will continue to tell. But it was such a small part of what your year is as a state title holder. But to be an expert, you must be a beginner first, of course. I was a train wreck. Have, has anyone started a new job or started a new sport kind of later than other people? Like if you were like a late bloomer on, you know, football, but now then you were the, you know, D1 kicker and everyone's mad at you. You know, you, we've all had those moments where you have to be bad at something to be really good at it. They say it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything. And even being a Rotarian, it takes time takes time to invest in. And hopefully, you know, when you're the newbie, there are people there that will, that will guide you and rally around you because it took a lot for me to get where I am. I'm a recovering tomboy. Um, and I don't know if you all have any of those, but it took me, my mom about 16 years to put a dress on me. Um, and she said, this is the best revenge because you're now Miss Tennessee. So it was pretty cool because she had a lot of dresses for a year and all the years leading up to it. 
But because of Miss America, I want to just finish with this because I hope that if you remember nothing else, you remember to have conversations, you remember to uh, vote on November 8th, but you also remember that Miss America is so much more than your grandma's Miss America or your, your perception of the pageant girl next door, right? I've earned scholarships. I've earned, I've learned so much about interviewing, speaking, fundraising. I brought in tens of thousands of new partners and sponsors. I fundraised, I fundraised, I was top five in the nation for fundraising for our scholarship fund. Um, you fail forward in this organization. You learn what it is to lose. Everyone gets a participation trophy for everything now. And sometimes you gotta lose. Sometimes that builds character, right? And so I, I think you learn how to lose, but how to learn from the loss, right? Um, women in business scholarship. Um, I met students who really cared. I feel like I was a little dismal there for a few minutes, but it's not so bleak. There's a really incredible group of Tennesseans who are coming of age and that need us to not be so hopeless about voting, about our country, about partisanship. It's our job because they're listening. They're listening to you in classrooms, at home. They're listening to us about how we treat other people, how we talk to other people. They are parrots, right? And I'm not that much older than them. And so hopefully I could garner that trust with them. But I've, I heard a, a first grader in Wilson County or Gibson County, excuse me, in West Tennessee shout. She was a first grader. And he, all he did was he sat in the back of the classroom and he shouted Trump over and over and over. I'm like, whose parents, who let you, and it's, it's okay. Like that's if, you know, if his parents voted for president Trump, that's one thing, but who is tra chanting Trump aggressively at home and he's coming into the classroom. It's just, it's crazy. Right. And it happens all across the board. And so my question now is why does Miss Tennessee matter? What does she stand for? Does it count? I hope so. I think so. And I hope that I leave you thinking that it does too, because this is just one platform. Everyone has a platform, right? Are you, did you just retire as the chief? Yeah. You know, news tra travels fast around here. Okay. So his platform, right? He, you had a voice, right? And we all do. And ro Rotary is a platform for you to stand on, for you to be heard, and for you to serve other people. And I think that's what Miss Tennessee is. Um, so that's my kind of pitch. Um, but I just so appreciate being here. I appreciate being heard. And hopefully I just have started a, a small dialogue. Um, and I'd be happy to answer a few questions if you have them. Kelly. Yeah. Did you choose your guiding principle or was that chosen for you? Uh, the voting is naturally nonpartisan. Yeah, I, I kind of made that up. Um, I'm not the first person that said it, but um, the social impact initiative is something that every local title holder has. So I served as Miss Parsons, I served as Miss Music Row, and then I served as Miss Nashville through COVID for two years before I was crowned Miss Tennessee. And so everyone has a social impact initiative to earn a local title and earn scholarships at the local level. You have to write a one page essay about what your social impact initiative is and what you would be doing. And so, um, I started working in this field initially called power of citizenship. And then I changed it to vote with a vision was my initiative name this year was called vote with a vision. And, um, everyone gets to build their own social impact initiative, which is super cool. Um, and then from there, whoever is chosen for Miss Tennessee, that becomes the state's initiative for the year. So it's, it is definitely a responsibility to take it from the local, but have a plan to take it to the state level and also be able to go into a Miss America interview and say, why me, why this mission? And you know, why these principles for, for the nation? So I had one for you, Tally. Yes. I, I wanted to ask you this before you got up to speak. Um, I think you, this is a comment first. I think you should follow the uh, example of the grandfather and uh oh, here we go. Perhaps consider Rotary. I think you would be a great <laughs> addition, certainly to this club. Um, Thank you. You're not the first Rotary group in the last year that has tried to recruit me, and I'm honored. I truly am. Well, we we will. I'm keep very trying. interested. We Please. try harder. Okay, so in 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 your in your um, platform about voting, were you able to make any headway working with legislators? 
on the some of these issues that come up. I know voter ID is a big issue. Yeah. Some of these other things. Yeah, it's super um, hard in the role of Miss Tennessee. In part, yes, would be my initial answer, but also, unfortunately, not enough. Um, I think it starts with conversation. So going to DC and speaking to both of our US senators and talking to them about that it matters to me and that it should matter to you and not that it doesn't matter to them, right? They are elected officials. They should care about people showing up. Um, but I think one of the things that's really tough is that the job of Miss Tennessee is not a partisan position. And it's really, um, I'm even more honest about my experiences now than I, I was maybe during my year, because you don't, you're not a partisan position. You can have personal opinions and you can speak on those, but Miss Tennessee is for every Tennessean, right? And so with legislation that unfortunately right this second feels very partisan driven and doesn't have to feel that way, it was really tough to walk into the room and draft legislation. But one of the things I did do was that I, um, supported both in funding and as a keynote speaker for the youth and government program. Um, if you guys know youth and government, did anyone do that? Yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, youth and government through the YMCA Center for Civic Engagement was a really big organization for me growing up in high school. I also did Tennessee Intercollegiate State Legislature in college which is a mouthful, but um, but I did that as well. And so I have experienced drafting legislation and I have seen actual legislation from youth and government and TISL that are now state law. So one of the things that I did, the way I felt like I could work from a legislative perspective, other than just speaking to people, was to advocate for, fundraise for, and speak at these massive 600 student, high school student programs that are in the state house and that are drafting legislation that could potentially go across Governor Lee's desk and could potentially go through committees and become law because I've seen it. I hope that answers your question. I know there are probably a lot of things that separate the Miss USA and the Miss America pageants, mm -hmm. but one, I believe, is Miss America has a talent component, and you yes. didn't mention that. So what was your talent? Yeah, so uh, I actually sang and played piano. I did Hear You Come Again by our queen, Dolly Parton, um, and I did it as it was a bit of a remix. It was I did a little EDM flair, and actually, I will literally hang my hat on this, but Dolly Parton sent me a good luck video. I should have brought it. It was an honor. I could not even believe it. But um, Senator Blackburn's field director knew her manager, Danny at CTK and Danny finessed. So I'm very, very, I mean, I was like crying. I was like, I'm done. I don't need to, I don't need to go on stage for finals. I was like, we're good. We can pack up and go, but that was really cool. But that's what I did. Okay. Uh, mine's a little different question. What is your view on some of the reality shows on pageants and how the girls are portrayed, the parents act? Uh, what's some of your thoughts on that? Mm. All right, someone keep me on time. Um, no, I, so I grew up as a competitive dancer. I was an athlete. I did rowing at the National Junior Rowing Association, like the boats in high school. I, I was an athlete and um, I grew up with a bunch of guys. And again, like I would like rip the bow off at church. My mom was like, I had no hair for two years. Everyone thought I was the cutest little boy. And that's great. You know, you can wear bows or not. It doesn't matter who you are, but, um, I did not want them. And so I was again, like recovering tomboy. I, I still to this day am just as comfortable, you know, in, in any setting that I was then. And, um, one of the things that drew me away from pageantry and why I was not a part of it was because of the portrayal on toddlers and tiaras and even Miss Congeniality, the movie, which I look at now as almost a, um, funny kind of joke, but it, it actually does, I think, draw away from the impact of, um, these organizations. And so like the Miss USA program, it's not a talent competition and they do have the lifestyle and fitness with the swimsuit and that's okay. They're competing to be an ambassador. They're competing to be a celebrity. They're competing to be on TV sets, be out in LA driving a Porsche. That's awesome. That's a different mission, but Miss America is driven for scholarships. We're the number one scholarship provider for women in the U S. Um, and also we're very service focused. And so it's, it's really tiring, honestly, to see these like world peace, like all the time, like these memes about pageant girls. And you know what? Sometimes there are women that continue that stereotype, but at, above and beyond, it is 
that they're educated women in USA, Miss America, they're smart, they're educated, they're really in tune with what their community needs, and they're doing a lot to impact that. Appreciate your talk. I have a question for you. Uh, you obviously had some amazing experiences this last year. So what would you say your most memorable experience would be? And the last thing I'll say is that I'm sure you've been invited to many, uh, to join many rotaries, but this is the best one. So just to let you know that. So you I, I just want one of these buttons. This is very unique. Okay, good. That makes me, that's even more exciting. But thank you for that question. Um, so much is memorable. Obviously, Dolly, like I'll never get over it. But um, I, I do think that honestly, some of my most challenging moments are some of my most memorable because sometimes when you're challenged, it's like your status quo doesn't work and you have to go above and beyond not being listened to, not being taken seriously. Like that is where I thrive because part of the job of Miss Tennessee is to break down these misconceptions, as I mentioned. And so for me, I think the state Senate was a huge moment for me because I remember thinking like, I'm the minority in the room. I'm a woman. I'm young and they don't care. They do not care that I'm here. They don't, they've had, they used to have so many little pageant girls come through apparently. And we had to fight with the clerk's office to give me like literally five minutes. Um, thanks to Senator Kerry Roberts from um, Robertson County's district. I forget the number. Um, but so it, it's moments like that. I think those are the really challenging ones where you realize like I have to literally do more and be more and step up to this plate or no one's going to care. Um, so those are the big moments. Obviously, Miss America was incredible. And one of the most fun moments was that our very first Alaskan Miss America was crowned. She's also the first Korean American to ever be Miss America. And her name is Emma. And she is still the reigning Miss America until December. And her homecoming was the first ever Miss America homecoming in Alaska. And one of the highest attended, 24 of us in February, you know, just went all the way there. I could have been in London by then. But um, I went all the way to Alaska and 24 of us were there to celebrate her and to bring her home for her homecoming. And we got to hang out with sled, sled dogs. We were skiing. We were like in the parade in Anchorage for um, the sled race. I forget that. Thank you. The Iditarod was starting. It was absolutely wild. So that was one of definitely another memorable one. A um, couple of wipeouts on the slopes we won't talk about. Any other questions? Yep. <laughs> Actually, I had the honor to be at the unveiling of the Women's Suffrage Monument before they put it on the pedestal, although I wish the pedestal was more skateboard or skateboarder resistant than it is, but it was oh awesome to see you involved in trying to encourage women to vote and be registered voters, anybody really for that matter. Yeah. But um, what other organizations have you worked with, like the League of Women Voters, or basically um, what have, who have you been able to work with to encourage people, but women in particular, to either be politically active, regardless of their affiliation, but to vote and to be active in the in the process? Yeah, I love the monument. Um, and I didn't think about the skateboard thing, but hopefully it doesn't get worse. But um, yeah, so one of the organizations um, is that that organization I've can I connected with the organization that created the suffrage monument. Um, I did with, through my podcast, the suffragette series, I connected with people who are currently in office or are working with organizations. One of those is, um, she votes Inc. It's an organization, uh, and a think tank out of DC that encourages women to become ambassadors for she votes on their college campuses. So we work to get a, a Nashville she votes ambassador at Belmont university that's starting this fall. And that includes a stipend to in to encourage voter registration and also to um, empower women on the Belmont campus and across campuses that she votes works with. And her episode of the podcast is coming out soon. Shannon Lynch is the executive director of she votes and she also um, works in DC at a different think tank as well. So that's a really cool organization. I highly recommend she votes is a really cool organization to support headcount.org brings in my music industry background, um, my Belmont background and headcount goes on tour with artists to do voter registration drives at concerts. And you're when you volunteer, you're there and you get to go to the concert as well sometimes. So I've um, worked with Headcount at Pilgrimage Festival before in Franklin. Um, and then also another big one is, again, the Youth and Government Program through the YMCA. Uh, and also the League of Women Voters are amazing. I did some social media work with them, but I didn't really get to be in person with them. A year goes so fast. <laughs> it really does. I would have loved to do even more.
in the pageant world. Mm. Um, I honestly think that Miss America genuinely has moved so far away from pageantry that when we removed the swimsuit competition, I actually was not, com- I didn't compete in an evening gown competition. That is now back. Evening gown is back because it's okay to be glamorous as women to say that women can't be strong, smart, educated, super involved, and also glamorous almost takes away from who we are as women and puts us into a box. And so Miss America is kind of shifting back into that glamorous side, but I think Miss America should be on more red carpets. I think she should be even more present. People just say, where's Miss America? What's she doing? If it doesn't show up on social media, it's like, she's not doing anything anymore. And Emma has an incredible platform with special Olympics and works with specially abled children across the country and has become an ambassador for special Olympics. So I would just love Miss Tennessee and Miss America to get booked more, um, and to continue to be a massively, um, important public figure. You don't have to call it a celebrity, you know? Um, but also if you guys want to book Miss Tennessee, she's awesome and she's around. So she's also always available. But I think also what we need is the, the alumni network of the Miss Tennessee organization and the Miss America organization to rally around, um, to rally around the organization now, because we have gone through changes, but it doesn't mean we're not still Miss America. I have amazingly met several Miss Americas in this area of Middle Tennessee yeah. live here. What is it about Middle Tennessee that brought them here? And is there any sort of an alumni network that would connect you all? That's a really good question. I honestly, I literally fangirl still having gone to Miss America if I meet a Miss America um, because they do represent so much. And Miss America is a full-time six-figure job. She Emma earned a $100,000 scholarship at Miss America this year. Um, I mean, insane. It's an incredible opportunity. It's literally life-changing for us to even be there, but especially for Emma. I think Nashville in general is just a really hot place right now. I don't know if y'all have noticed the traffic, um, but it's, I mean, half of the people, you're, if you look around and you see a woman in the car next to you, just assume she's a Miss America. Um, because she, she, you know, there's so many women that have moved here. There's a former Miss Washington from 2015 who now lives in Nashville. Um, there's a bunch of Miss Alabamas that have moved up. It's Alabama is too close. Um, no, I'm kidding. Don't tell her I said that. But, um, but I don't know. I think Nashville is very central. I think Middle Tennessee is a wonderful place to be, and I, I hope that can, they continue to come here so I can hang out with them. Um, but yeah, that's I don't know. It's a really good question uh, regarding alumni. Um, I'm working to improve the alumni network for the Miss Tennessee organization. Um, but I'd love to see, I'm, I think there's probably some sort of Miss America group. That's like, you know, I don't know about, it's a little bit like the Masons or something, you know, the Knights of the round table, the Knights of Miss America, you know what I mean? Yeah. The Queens of the round table is what they're called it, but yeah, I don't know, but it, yeah, any chance you can get, you know, you can book a former Miss Tennessee like me to speak at your events independently. You can book Miss Tennessee to come to your events, big or small. I promise Miss Tennessee does not cost as much as you think she does to come to your event. And if it's a nonprofit event, there's also ways to get um, discounts or just do mileage or whatever. And so anyways, it's just, it always adds a little bit of glamour, but make her speak if you bring Miss Tennessee where she, wherever you are, because she's so much more than that. Do we have time for one more? Any more? Either through Miss Tennessee or Miss America, were there times where you felt pressure to promote a political ideology or a political platform that you didn't necessarily believe in? Hmm. No, I really didn't. Um, We are not a a politically affiliated organization. What's really cool is that if the Miss America organization at the national level believes in something, um, it doesn't have to mean that you must align with it to be a title holder. Um, I typically do align with a lot of the ways in which Miss America has changed and their inclusionary goals, um, but almost it's the opposite. Like they don't want people to feel disenfranchised in Tennessee over a political affiliation because Tennessee's organization, no organization has a a political affiliation. And I actually, as Miss Tennessee, could not attend any campaign events with any political 
um, incumbents or, you know, hopefuls. So there were actually rules to safeguard you and your image from political affiliation as Miss Tennessee. Um, you could go as you, I could go up to as Tally to support someone, but I wouldn't be able to attend as Miss Tennessee to a p political events and campaigns. But um, obviously I have my own opinions. I'm definitely more opinionated than I was during my year outwardly, but it doesn't mean that um, I've ever felt pressure to, to be a certain way because of the organization. It's a good question though. I'm sure there are other places like it. Okay. Yeah, go Bruins. My son is a senior. So the question is, what school has more Miss Americas than any university? Oh, um, wait, I think it's Oklahoma. Yes, yeah. Three Miss Americas came out of a university in Oklahoma. There's a statue. Good one. No. Um, yeah. Well, you know, don't call me an old miss yet. I just ended. I just ended my year, but I'm just kidding. But thank you so much, you guys. Thanks for having me. Um, the crown is here if you want to look at it. The crown is here. Thank you so much, Tally. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. I feel like I need to go uh, get on Little People Big World right now. <laughs> so we give our speakers as a gift for speaking to our club a pen that has our logo on it. And we, like you, read to uh, children. So this is a book about Rotary that our club reads to first graders. If you would sign it, we will... Uh, we will tell the kids about your visit to our club. Thank you so much. Any other uh, announcements? Okay, if there's nothing else for the good of Rotary, we are adjourned.